This is Corey Willis with PPI, and you're listening to the Diesel Podcast. I'm Adam Blattenberg from Diesel World. Hi, this is Dan, owner of Dan's Diesel Performance. I'm Christian Roth of BD Diesel. I'm Braden Fleece, and you're listening to the Diesel Podcast. What is going on, Diesel Nation? We're excited to have you guys with us today on the Diesel Podcast. Today we're going to be chatting with Frank from RevMax Converters, and RevMax just released a brand new part for 68 RFE transmissions, and it's their upgraded pump. And we had seen it on Instagram and Facebook, and there was a lot of chatter about it. So we wanted to chat with Frank and ask him, what does it do for like a stock transmission or you know something that's mildly built or even a performance 68 RFE? What are some of the inherent weaknesses in the factory pump? And then what does this pump do differently? So we're excited to be able to go through that with him. We wanted to encourage you guys, if you're listening to us on podcast apps, make sure you subscribe to the Diesel Podcast on YouTube. We do have a ton of information, comments, discussions that go on on our videos when we post them there. And we also have some ex- exclusive content as well from some of the uh, the guests that we have on the podcast they might have a cool truck video or install or just different things like that that we post up over there on youtube all right let's get to the podcast with frank and chatting about this new 68 rfe pump frank i'm excited to chat with you about some 68 rfe pump upgrades it was really cool to see on like instagram and facebook this new product and it's uh i think it's gonna be really important for you know, obviously 68 RFE owners to know about, but I really wanted to jump into the details with you and see what you guys did, what all that went into it, and what what kind of capability it's given the Dodge owners out there. Yeah, so, you know, there's been a lot of attention lately over the past, oh, 18 months or so about billet channel plates, which we started five years ago, and now is really kind of, everyone's got real excited about that. Um, and there's been a, almost zero talk about the pumps. So the, the pumps in the CCT RFE, actually have more valves in the valve body that does, which is kind of backwards. Um, and there's two halves. There's your, your pump stator and then your pump body. Uh, and the pump body, currently, there is, the only way you can replace the pump body is with buying a whole new pump. And the center pump gear on the 60 RFE, as well as the uh, side auxiliary gears, are very, very notorious for wearing into the aluminum um, on, on the pump body. So currently, we basically have the option of buying a new one, resurfacing those. I don't know anyone who's actually rebuilding those. Um, they're, they're so flimsy that I don't think you actually could, or if you did, it wouldn't be very good. Uh, and a lot of shops, unbeknownst to them, they think that they're doing their customer a, uh, a bonus by flat sanding the pumps. And when we point out to the people out there, we're actually going to be releasing a video on this here pretty shortly, if you flat sand that pump to the point where you actually get it flat in that pump body, you actually have zero pump clearance from the face of the pump gear to the pump separator plate. So not only are you doing the customer a disservice, you're actually going to cause them to have a trans failure over time due to inadequate clearance of the pump gears. So currently, if you want to make your 60 RFE pump flat, there is no way to do it. And we have been taking these pumps apart for many, many years, for over a decade now, and we, we constantly see the same thing. They're warped like crazy. So if, if you've got a, a service table, a granite service table, and you were to put one of these pump bodies on a service table and hold down one side and tap the other side, the actual, the actual pump body will rock back and forth. We've seen on average around eight to 10 thousandths. Um, the good, good ones are around two to three thousandths, and a bad one's about 20 thousandths. Now think about this. Your clearance between your pump gear face and your separator plate is one and a half to two thousand. So there's nothing you can do again to make that pump flat without actually, you know, uh, making those two come into contact with one another. So uh, our new body has accomplished many things. Uh, number one, it's almost three times thicker across the whole cross section of that body, so it's not going to warp anymore. Which is the reason why we did it. Start with it because of the warpage. So we get rid of that issue. Uh, secondly, it gives us the ability to actually service it and put a good part in there. Um, so now the customer can take this new pump body, transfer his pump pinion, uh, sorry, pump uh, guide pins for his pump gears, put those in there, and now he's got a pump that's absolutely perfect. Brand new specs as far as the OE uh, um, clearances on the pump gears. And now you've got actually a, a true upgraded performance pump that's not going to warp. And on top of that, we went ahead and we added a dry film Durbond bushing to the center pump gear, 
which then keeps us running perfectly true, and we don't have to worry about any leakage around the center of the pump gear like we would the factory one, because as most of the guys out there that know that build these, the factory pump body is aluminum, and you've got a steel gear riding on it with no bushing. So pretty much 9 out of 10 of those you take apart will have some kind of wear either to the gear or to the body, and this now fixes that problem as well. So that takes care of the body side of it. Now we can look at back at the stator side of it. So the stator side has all the valves in it. It's the complicated part of it, let's say. And now that we've got a perfectly flat front half, we need to make sure that stator is now perfectly flat as well. The good news is, is once you un unbolt the stator tube from the stator assembly itself, you can then flat sand that, that particular part on a flat sanding table and make it perfectly flat so when it mates back up with, your, with the new pump body, you've got a perfectly true and amazing you know, pump when you're all said and done. What's really interesting about talking about 68 RFEs, and, and we have over our last few episodes, is different components to them that the stock parts just don't last, whether it was our valve body talk or some of the other um, upgrades that, that you've mentioned to us. And I, when I think of the pump, and I, and I definitely like to relate this to you know, the guy out there that has a 60 RFE in his truck is what kind of failures or issues happen in say a stock transmission when some of the clearance issues happen on a stock pump is it like immediate transmission failure is it just wear over time it doesn't last as long what do they notice when the factory pump has issues it's a really interesting point um, so, the, so there's, there's, there's several things. Actually, before I go into that, I want to say one more thing about the flatness issues um, and the warpage issues. So this whole big thing about the channel plates um, warping, that's true. And you can see the actual warp marks on the separator plate from the channel plates when they start flexing. Well, the same thing with the pump. When you take a pump apart in 68, you'll see the exact same marks moving along. Now, the difference is the stock channel plates in general, when we take those apart, we're seeing between two maybe three thousandths total from end to end on most of the ones we take apart as far as you know being unflat so compared to what we're seeing the pumps those big channel plates are actually flatter than the pumps are so again really really important to keep that pump flat now the issues that people see um they are wide and varied um, one of the big complaints that people will see is the converter dragging when they're coming up to a stop so all of a sudden, you've been driving around, and all, you come to a stop, and bang, the converter starts to drag. And that's dragging um, due to the warpage, due to cross leakage inside that pump. That, that's one reason that can happen. The other reason is due to tuning for excessive pressure. Um, we can talk about that on a whole other episode about tuning. But um, those are the two issues um, as far as dragging the pump. And the biggest, one, the, the biggest two are tuning and then cross leakage. Secondly, the way the 60 RFE works is the, the pump is a, is a distribution block for the most important part of the transmission. You have the underdrive, the overdrive, and the reverse clutch. And as you know, Patrick, the overdrive clutch is the Achilles heel of the 60 RFE. Yeah. And um, anything you can do to keep that, that, that whole circuit from leakage is going to serve you well. So uh, over time with, with warpage, you'll start again, you'll get leakage. So you could get some overdrive apply oil into the underdrive passage. You can get reverse into the overdrive and vice versa. So um, some of these concerns we, when these builders take these units apart and they have these phantom underdrive and overdrive failures where they just can't seem to find the problem. They've replaced the valve body. They've replaced, you know, all the clutches, and it just keeps coming back. Uh, a lot of times those issues can be traced right back to the pump as well as, you know, operator temperatures. So people that are having issues with temps that are skyrocketing that have already had like a thermal bypass on these trucks and additional cooling systems, a lot of times that temperature that you're, that you're seeing is actually being created because you've got the incorrect oil going to the incorrect clutch and you've got a clutch that's just slightly dragging, like dragging a brake down the road. So that, those are the biggest things that, that people will see um, other than the, the conventional pump issues, which are, are noise, um, erratic pressure is another thing as well that you can see as well. So, you know, if you have a 60 RFE and you watch on a scan tool, you'll see that um, at times the, uh, the actual desired pressure, the actual pressure will be jumping all over the place. And that can be due to excessive or not enough pump gear clearance. So 
you'll see that your actual and desired line pressures with one of these billet pumps will be a lot closer to what, it, to what the desired is. So um, that's also really nice because what happens is when you have a closed loop circuit like a 60 RSE and your, your desired line pressure let's, is say at uh, 200 PSI for argument's sake and all of a sudden you see a, a spike in actual pressure to let's say 205 or 210. Well, then the computer sees that and it says, oh, no, I'm too high, and it brings it down, and then it undershoots, and you get low, and vice versa happens. So you can have some really aggressive hard shifts when you have you know, differentials in those two numbers, and, they're, and the computer's chasing itself back and forth. So some shifting complaints um, are, are very common as well on, from pump issues. There's a lot of issues I can think of reading over the years with what you mentioned where you know say there's a, a transmission built or something or just anything I, i've seen on a facebook group or forums or whatever and it's like they'll go through two valve bodies or three trying to fix a problem or you know the overdrive's burned and they throw a new set of clutches in and clean everything out and it's still doing it still doing it and they just chase that issue for so long and eventually just get frustrated with it and when you were describing the factory pump and the weak points in it it's just it, it, there's there's so many variables that i think have been taken out of these transmissions in the episodes that we've chatted with you where 10 or 12 years ago it's no wonder these things didn't last it's no wonder it was so hard to get them to be reliable when you have these weak points in the factory architecture or materials or just any little variance in it can throw everything off and you throw in a computer that's really smart and can see this stuff and it's like i can see where a lot of those 68 rfe nightmares and long huge posts on facebook or you know a forum would come from yeah and it's you know it's not just the pump it's the valve bite, it's the input clutch drum it's the plant trigger set it's the bushing it's you know all these different things and all these little things matter it's like building a motor you know people we always, always joke over here that, you know, people don't want to spend any money on the transmission, but they have no problem spending money on turbos and fuel and, and engines. They're all about yeah. that. Yeah. But when it comes time to the transmission, man, you know, people don't realize the transmission has the most working, you know, moving components out of anything in the entire drivetrain. And, you know, you start stacking up a couple issues here and there, a few thousands here and there. Before you know it, you have a major problem. And you start running into, the, again, these phantom problems that people just can't solve. Um, you know, and then those issues get worse because then you've got parts, you've got guys out there, these builders out there that, that think they know this secret recipe and they claim these people they know this recipe. So they have 25 different manufacturers' parts going into one transmission. We talked about this before. And what you get is this bastard child that you just cannot make work because the parts just don't work well together. And manufacturer A doesn't know what manufacturer B does, and, and you know it just keeps going down the road, down the line. And until you actually know how everything works together, um, you know, just throwing parts at a unit typically doesn't work very well. I saw a lot of a lot of people with high horsepower 68 RFEs that were chatting and commenting on the post you guys did when you showed pictures of the pump. And I know that the question is going to come up with the performance crowd is, okay, I've, you know, I've got a 6.7, I'm committed to running a 68 RFE. For the performance aspect and long-term holding of power, what does this pump give you guys or allow you to do to be able to hold the extra power and just be able to give them a 68 RFE solution for the power range that they're in? Well, you know, we can just kind of use the human anatomy, you know? So the pump is the heart, man. Um, if your heart's not pumping very well you're not going to be running very well uh, you know you might walk but you're not going to be able to run um so keeping that pressure like we said talking about the desire and actual narrow as close together as possible having the optimal pump gear clearance it's the same thing that on a motor we'll talk about motors again or a turbocharger if you're bearing to you know if you're bearing um bearings on your on your motor to your crankshaft are, are, are not spec correctly and you've got a bunch of excess ex excessive clearance or if they're too tight how long is that crank going to last? It's not going to last. Yeah. It's yeah. the same thing, you know? So, you know, turbochargers, engines, transmissions, it's all about tolerances. So people that, you know, they, they look at a pump, they take it apart, yep, looks good. I guarantee you, 
nine out of ten builders out there are not checking the pump gear clearance on, on, on the 68s when they build them because they don't even have the tools to even do it. I can guarantee you they don't have it. So, um, again, you, oh, it looks good. Put it back here again. Well, is it good? How much, pin, how much wear is there on the guide pins? Is there, which is not very common, but if you do, how much is there? What are your, what, what are your, what's your tolerance from one side versus the other side? What's your face, what's your face you know, tolerance? There's just so many little things that when you just take something apart and look at it real fast and put it back together again, especially nowadays where there was, there was no option. So, well, I hope it looked good because I really don't have an option to really to fix this any, anything better than what I started with. Yeah. With, with. With doing this, at least now people have the, the ability to just take this part and put it in and put it down the road and know you have a great working pump. Now, is it a pump that can you run it on – say, it's more of a stock-ish type rebuild, or is it something you can use from there all the way to the you know, performance transmission build with billet parts and, you know, it's going to be living behind a truck with, you know, a good amount of torque and power going through it? Oh, ab- absolutely. Um, it, from a stock, complete bone stock truck to the crazy 68 like our drag truck, any of those, this pump will work, well, will work perfectly. There's no machining to do. It's a plug-and-play part. All you need to do is, you, again, you, you take an arbor press, you press out your two pump pins that hold your, your uh, auxiliary gears in place, pop those guys out, put them in the new body, off you go. I know that's a, a question. A lot of times it pops up with transmissions, especially when we have options and shafts and just other upgrades. It's like, well, do I really need that? Is that really going to help me? I'm only making you know, 500 horsepower, 550 or 450, do I really need that? And I know a lot of our listeners are going to ask, well, you know, can I run it on my more mild build or is it just something for racing? And I think it's always really helpful when people are out there looking at options is to know, like with the valve body talk we have, it's not just a race product. It's not just something that goes in a race, you know, behind a race engine or something. It's something for the daily driver or the truck that's towing. Yeah, so, you know, this is not as easy to do as a valve body, of course. You've got to pull the trans out to put this in. So I don't expect people to be jumping out there to, to put a pump body in. But listen, the cost is not crazy. We're, we're keeping the cost down as best we could in these parts. Um, it's a, you know, it's about the same price as our valve body plate. Um, th- I, you'd be crazy not to change this while you're in there, especially yeah. if you've got a truck with 100,000 miles on at that point. Um, either replace with a new factory pump if you want to go with a factory pump, or go with our pump body and flat sand your, your, your stator and have a better setup, the cost is going to be about the same probably to the customer when it's all said and done. I would put this part in there 10 times over a factory one. Um, once we can get our production capabilities up to be able to make enough of these, uh, we will be doing it as a standard item in every one of our 68 builds. So uh, hopefully within the next 90 days or so, we'll be able to make enough for us and the demand. And then going forward, this will be standard issue. And, and from our 550s, all the way up to our, 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 you know, our 12 XR units. We'll be putting them in every unit. Oh, the 12 XR. I don't know if we talked about that before, but that sounds. I'm used to the Red Max 550 and the 850. What's the one you just mentioned? If you can tell us about it. Yeah. So the uh, the 12 XR is our newest evolution of the 60 RFE. Um, it's it's required pretty much every part we've made at this point to get to that point. So we, it's taken our built steel center support, a modified version of that, um, to be able to run this. The, the drums themselves are actually different physically. The, the sizes of the 12XR drum is actually a different length. Uh, both the outer and inner drum is a different length than the, uh, than the 850, 700, and 550 units are. And what, we're, what we've been able to do um, is we can now get up to 20 clutches in a 68 input clutch drum in the overdrive section without taking out any underdrive clutches. So factory is 12, if you think about that, from the factory, an overdrive clutch. We're at 20 now. Uh, (laughs) So we can run 20 single-side clutches. We can run up to eight um, dual-sided clutches in there. Um, And again, in order to do that, it also required yet another part, which is our built overdrive clutch hub, which we talked about before, um, and thank, thankfully, those are now back in stock. We've been out of those for a while, but those are now back in stock. Um, so with that built clutch hub, it's, for the 12XR, it's actually even taller than our standard clutch hub. So it has enough you know, spline length for the, the inner clutch to grab onto. At, at, once you get past 16 clutches in a 60 RFE, there's no more clutch length there. But the new clutch hub it has, is actually physically taller 
to uh, to accommodate that. This is just a question I thought of right now, and I, I I know I've never asked you this, and I've never found out the answer. But we hear of single sided and double sided clutches, and people wonder which one's best. And I'm I'm sure there isn't a maybe per se which one's best, but there's different things that factor into, you know, based on what transmission we're talking about. But I know a lot of people when they're shopping for a transmission or a rebuild kit or something like that, we see single and double-sided clutches. As it pertains to 68 RFEs, is one better? Does it give you more holding capacity? Or how do you, how would you approach that if you were a truck owner, you know, looking to get a new transmission and you see single or double-sided clutch packs? Well, it's a really loaded question. And on the security, it gets even more loaded. Um, so um, being that the inner drum is an aluminum drum uh, for the 60 RFE, the dual-sided clutch is probably not the greatest setup in there. And here's the reason why. You have, if you have single-sided frictions, you've got 20 external teeth. On, let's, we'll, we'll, actually, let's go back. Let's pretend it's a stock 60 RFE. You've got 12 external teeth basically that are that are gonna are gonna are gonna grab on there. Um, sorry, six external teeth, six external anyways, we got we got half basically of what we'd have if we had a dual sided setup. So the thing is this, we've got less mass. So you've got that tooth that goes into the into the drum. Mm-hmm. There's a little bit of clearance that you have to have, otherwise it will bind up when it gets hot and when it applies. So that little bit of movement now allows that that tooth to constantly kind of dig in to that outer basket over and over and over again. And over time, it kind of turns into a, like a chisel, and then you get more, more power behind it because now the, the gap's getting bigger and bigger, and then it starts turning like a battering ram. And before long, you really tear up that, uh, the basket, the clutch drum. So when you're running the dual-sided clutches, you have, ha- you, have, you have less teeth to engage with. So you've got a bigger battering ram going into there. So, in my opinion, on, on 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 this particular setup, I would not recommend. I, I would don't. I don't like the dual clutch setup on on 68. Um, then we can go to you know thermal efficiency and friction friction coefficients and everything like that. The single sided clutch gives you the most thermal mass to dissipate the heat to. Um, you know, the old 40 REs, the factory builds, the overdrive directs. Those were single sided clutches. Those never really failed. The dual sides fail more than those, even they don't fail a lot, but the single sides were better. You can get a little bit more. You can get one to two more additional surfaces of friction by using a single-sided clutch. But once a single-sided clutch gets hot, it will tweak and bow faster than a dual-sided will because the dual-sided clutch, you've got a piece of steel, which is your heat sink, okay, and it's basically insulated between two pieces of friction material. So, it, it, you know, you, you, everything just kind of stays cooler that way versus the single side, it's, it's hot against hot, and, you know, it's, it's a tough, it's tough on a 68, you know, everything's working against you in the, that overdrive clutch. I mean, literally everything. Um, that's why our direct oiling setup on our input shafts is so crucial. It's all these little things have all come over time to make them live, but, there, there, there is no perfect way, and it takes a lot of parts to, to, to get you to a point where it will live. I think that's the, the part that really sticks out to me is when I think of other transmissions and, you know, there's a bunch of different parts, whether it's servos and pans and apply levers and clutches and all that kind of stuff where for years people would be able to piece it together. And, you know, it, it could work and it could be fine. But when we've been talking about 60 RFEs like we have recently on these episodes with you, is I really understand how everything is so intricate and tied together where if it's not lined up and there's not a track record for how these parts work together and they're even, you know, working together with the tuning or the, you know, the pressure commands and all that kind of stuff, I see why it was such a, such a hard transmission to get going way back when and it it just makes more sense to me just from an enthusiast standpoint of you know talking to people over the years or guys i'd see at the track and they're running you know this brand of this and that brand of that and they've got you know 40 passes on it no issues and then 
they tried it with a 68 RFE and it's like I smoked the overdrive as a first pass or um, you know, I smoked this just on the test drive or you know, I'm going through this a lot. And so it really helps to be able to chat with with you guys and you've been seeing them for, you know, like you said, over 10 years and understanding why it's so crucial how everything works together. Yeah, I mean, that that's the key. I mean, think about power glides and turbo 400s. That's the, you know, the, the mainstay in the racing world. Yeah. Well, people have had 40 years to figure those things out. And, you know, umpteen million parts have come on the market since those things have been, um, you know, released. And, you know, I hate to break it to the guys. There's no builder that has some secret special thing they do to it. They've just figured out on turbo power glides and 400s what actually works. But it's taken them 40 years. We've had the 60th only been out for, you know, a little over a decade, 12 years now. So um, how far they've come, I mean, look where 47 and 48 were, you know. Look, look, look at those things. People think they're the best thing ever. Um, and, and now, you know, 68s actually they hold their own now. You know, the new 10 speeds, I think we're going to be seeing a lot of problems with those 10 speeds. I mean, since we talked last, I mean, we've done several of the Allison 10 speeds. They cannot hold power at all. So people laugh at the 68s, but the Allison 10 speeds and the Ford 10Rs, get ready, man. You have, you have 68 issues in your hands. They do not hold power. I think that's, that's what um, is so interesting about this is things change. And this isn't even related to transmissions, but I was chatting on a previous episode um, with Casey Turbos about 6 liters. And we were like, man, you remember when six liters, like everyone would laugh and, oh, I don't want that. And like the leap forward they've had with power. Well, the same thing is true with transmissions and the time that it takes, especially with how complex they are. These fully electronic, you know, 68 RFEs and, and all the different components, how they fit together. And now the 10 speeds and it's just the time and the trial and error and R&D and, you know, thinking outside the box that, takes them a little bit of time you know to hold power and it's, it's very interesting to follow and i know you know as you mentioned earlier a lot of truck owners are like oh, I'll, I'll buy the turbo kit the engine that's not a big deal but my transmission uh, how can i cut some corners because it's not something like you go to a not truck sexy. Hey, yeah you, sexy, man. <laughs> no one's ever like hey can i crawl underneath your truck and look at your transmission but they want to see the engine but it's crucial to i mean if it doesn't work right you're not going to enjoy driving the truck, and you're not going to be going anywhere far. No, and you know, the other problem is, you know, trying to accommodate everyone's wants and needs. You know, one guy wants a transmission shift hard. Next guy doesn't want to feel his transmission shift. One guy <laughs> wants a firm lockup. One guy wants a soft lockup. One guy wants to lock in second gear. The other guy doesn't want to lock till fifth gear. Man, it's just, it's difficult, you know. And uh, at least with the motor, the motor guy builds the motor, and it's done. And nothing, nothing really changes. With the trans, man... You know, so it's, it's the part you don't see, but it's the part you feel every time, every three seconds you feel that transmission. And, oh, yeah. you know, your, your engine you kind of forget about, but the trans is always there because it's always doing something. Well, I remember, you know, with myself going from like a built 48RE to an Allison, I was like, I, I barely feel this thing shift. It's so nice. I didn't realize, you know, what, when I used to like the, the firm shift and the lockup and all the stuff on the 48RE, it's just like, it changes the driving experience and everyone is so, you know, has their preferences for, for what they like and, and what's comfortable to them. But I think it's, it's really awesome on these 68 RFEs to see the parts you guys have had just let alone this year and, and what they do. And I mean, I'm excited for a 1200 horsepower or, you know, 1200 horsepower rated 68 RFE where at one point it was like anything over a certain power level. It's like 48 swap it for, 10 or 12 or thirteen thousand dollars or whatever it was so it's really cool to see that yeah the guys who are at firepunk are actually running that exact that 12xr setup in there in uh their fifth gen truck they have over there right now i think it's close to around 12 and a horse as we speak um so it, i mean the, the set it works there's no question about it but it takes everything working in unison together tuning the trans the builder the driver and the big part is those two big variables are the tuner and the driver. I hate to break it to you. Uh, the, the, a driver can, you know, we always, we always tell people that when they call us, they say, well, when do I need to put a bill input shaft in it? We tell them, well, if you give me your truck right now with a, with a stock tune in it, I will break your stock input shaft right now in the parking lot. How could that be? Because if you drive it dumb enough, you can break anything 
anytime you want. You can break a built shaft. You can break, build, you know, break a fat shaft. You can break anything you want if you want to. So it really does come down to that driver being a sensible driver and being smart about when he does what he does with it um, to keep it alive as well. That's like a whole other podcast for us to talk about, or billet shafts and breakage, and the, there there is that perception like, well, once I go to a billet shaft, it's never going to break, and that's not it. That's and not I th- it. No, I think there there definitely be a lot of a lot of good info we can have, you know, a good discussion on it. But it was uh, it was good to learn more about this pump. I saw it, and I'm like, that's a beautiful transmission part. But I wanted to know what went into it, and what kind of benefits it would offer, you know, somebody from you know, stock power all the way up to, you know, these, these performance builds. So it was, uh, it was great to chat with you, Frank, and connect the dots on that. And really, you know, it's a part that addresses a failure in the, you know, from the get go with how these were designed and the materials and a lot of the issues people have fought over the years, you know, like I said, when you were talking about them, like I read a post about that. I remember a guy that was fighting that. I remember this guy going through this many valve bodies trying to figure it out and just a bunch of different things. Yeah, and like I said, if uh, maybe next time we could talk about uh, shafts because that's a really good interlude into shafts because there's so much to talk about there. And shaft technology on these new 10 speeds is so different than six shaft technology from the 6 speeds and completely different from the shaft technology of the 4 speeds, that's for sure. Don't forget, Diesel fans, make sure to head on over to YouTube and subscribe to the Diesel Podcast. Just search the Diesel Podcast. We'll pop right up for you. All of our episodes are there, and there's a lot of videos with tons of comments and discussion between listeners about either builds they've done with their truck or if they've encountered the same issue. And on the podcast, we're talking about that particular problem and how to remedy it. So there's a lot of great information and additional information as well from our listeners out there. Till next time, keep the shiny side up.